Welcome back to the First Gnostic Church of Christ. I know there's been about a two to three month silence from this channel to let you know that we are continuing and there may be periods while well, I'll step out for a month or two to gather my thoughts and sometimes for a break. I'm hoping that I can be much more proactive in getting a video up at least once a week so that we have continuity in our channel in our videos. That way that no one is concerned about whether or not I'm going to be taking another one or two year hiatus from the channel. So I appreciate everybody that is continuing to follow us. In this FGCC reads comments and answers questions, I will be picking up about three months ago and I'm going to be taking a different approach to the way that we've been addressing the comments and questions. Mainly I'll be addressing only questions and very short comments as far as interchanges of dialogue between uh, those that are subscribed to the channel discussing their viewpoints about their understanding of various scriptures or perhaps conspiracy theories. Those types of dialogues or interchanges, I won't be reading through those. Now if you definitely want me to read your question and have me provide an answer, then definitely make that known to me. I'll just simply say a question, even write the word question in capital letters, and then present your question so that I do not overlook you. That is in no way to discourage anybody from continuing to have awesome dialogues such as we've had with many here, including the last couple of videos where we focused a lot on the interchange between Dory and David Stanley. And I did this mainly because there was such a rich amount of discussion around various topics that I think are important for us to understand when it comes to picking up a new understanding of uh, what Christ meant when he came here to bring us the good news compared to what we've been taught all our lives and through the centuries by the Orthodox Church. Now, I haven't said all of that. Let's go ahead and pick up and I'm going to read first Dory asks this comment here because she does embed a question. She says, I really appreciate that you're doing this, Thomas. I like hearing your views and interpretations. I also um, want to say thank you to that, Dory, and let you know I also enjoy reading your comments. And I'm sure many others here on this channel enjoy reading the comments that you provide us here because they're often very well thought out and you are very committed to not only the Gnostic text, but also the canonical text, which I think is very important if we want to have a very cohesive understanding about Christ through the lens of Gnosticism. So thank you for being here for that purpose. Now, you say here that you have a question about what you said regarding division, and which I often do remind listeners that that word comes from duable or to divide. It's to split up in two parts. We also get the word devil. They all stem from the same word. We are told that Jesus said he came not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, when we think about the word sword, we want to, of course, think of this metaphorically. We don't want to think of a literal sword. Christ is, of course, not bringing a sword because nowhere in his actual walk on earth is there a moment that describes him carrying a sword around or bringing a sword. So obviously, we understand this is a metaphor for something else. And he's not bringing peace because it's not Christ's mission to bring peace or to bring war, but rather to bring understanding and knowledge. And what may come from that is not up to Christ. It is up to how things unfold from there. And Christ knows that when he brings the word of God, which is sword, is representing the word, as you point out later in your comment here, and I agree, and the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Jesus said a sword and went on to elaborate. 34, do not assume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, many people will interpret that, that Christ should be looked at as a warrior-like figure. And therefore, dominionists or those that believe we should use Christianity much like the caliphate do among the Islam or the, uh, the Muslims, the Catholics did during their crusade, is rightfully just. However, again, we already pointed out the sword is being referred to here is not an actual physical sword, and nor is it Christ's business to bring about peace, nor is it Christ's business to bring about war. Those are not his ultimate interest. Now, of course, he goes around and does suggest often be at peace, but that's not his ultimate mission. His ultimate mission is to bring forth the good news, 
Now, when he brings forth the good news, he understands that's going to result in exactly what you lay out here, Dory, in this chapter, in verse. He says, I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household, Matthew 12, 34, 36. Now, the reason he's come to do that is because he understands that change has to happen. There has to be a new covenant brought. But in order for that to happen, people have to turn away from the old covenant. This is just the way it works in this realm. And unfortunately, it's going to bring about all kinds of suffering. Christ is not going to be able to come here and walk a walk where his outcome from what he shares with humanity results in Penelope and flowers and uh, cushy you know, teddy bears. Unfortunately, because this is the realm of division and a suffering and death, whatever you present, whether it be of, of good intention or bad intention, it is going to result in some form of interchange. That interchange may result in giving away something that is mentally ill in exchange for something that is healthy mentally. Or it might be exchanging what is mentally healthy for something mentally ill. This is just the way this realm works. It works in a constant struggle to keep things at stasis. And that is the whole point of the Demiurge, is to keep things at stasis so that change cannot be had. In order that the light or the Gnosis be kept here, that is the spirit within us. Because without that light, he cannot create. It's through us that the Demiurge creates. Now, when we talk about creation, we're talking about creating from an emanation standpoint, not from forming or making as he does in chapter 2 Genesis, which is a completely different form of creating. So the two forms of creating that we talked about many times on this channel. Now you go on to say one of the Bible commentaries says he came to bring division of belief against unbelief. Now, I don't take that particular stand. I don't believe it is about whether or not you believe in that historical account that Jesus was a literal man that went to the cross that was the Son of God or not. When Christ talks about believing, he talks about believing in the good news. And it's Paul who then has his interpretation of that being accounting of your sins through repentance and believing the story of Christ walking on earth and dying after three days. That's not Christ's account. That's Paul's interpretation of Christ. Now, of course, you have to remember Paul is one of the more Gnostic characters in the Bible, but also one of the more very historically conservative hardline and he struggled with it greatly very much so as you can see throughout romans where he struggled with the the idea that all of his sins would be forgiven he couldn't imagine that but you go on to say he taught in parables to avoid teaching the pharisees now christ didn't actually teach we should avoid teaching the pharisees offered his message to everyone and he often confronted the pharisees so that they may see he even shared a great deal of time with one in particular, Nicodemus, went into great detail, painstakingly, more than anyone else that he had sat down with, to describe what he called having a, a, a rebirth, to be born again, as we call it in modern time. And Nicodemus had a very difficult time understanding what that meant. And Jesus sat down and spoke with him for a length of time, having dinner with him often. So it wasn't that Christ was avoiding teaching the Sadducees and Pharisees. There's a lot to grasp here, and I think it has everything to do with what he told them about not being the true children of Abraham, but that they were of their father of the devil. Now, I agree here, uh, but it's, it isn't that Christ avoided them for that purpose. Christ often confronted them. Now, what Christ instead, in my opinion, based upon what I've read of Gnostic texts and canonical texts and have meditated on and prayed about, have come to understand that when he talks about Father the Devil, he's talking about the eschatology and the philosophy and the dogma of the Old Testament of the Israelites that were brought through the line of Judah, through the, at that time the Jewish, were the type that brought about great division and suffering. So that's really what he's saying because the seed is not a physical seed. Now it is a physical seed in the sense of the lineage of Israel, but it's not a physical seed in a spiritual sense. The spiritual seed makes no account of whether you Jew or Gentile, as Christ had said. No Jew or Gentile, male or female. None of that is of consequence to Christ and the true Father. But when you have the Old Testament dividing that 
that through Levitical law, the laws everyone must adhere to, else be stoned to death or suffer eternal punishment, then of course you're going to bring about division. And that's the work of the devil, division. So they are of the demiurge and not the true father mother. We may disagree on where it goes from there, but Jesus is treating the situation as if it weren't going anywhere good for them. Absolutely, that pathway continues alive and well today. The vast majority of humanity follows after dogmatic religion, and it is the source of great suffering. This need to adhere to law and a right and wrong, this group is good and that group is bad, and I'm in the good group and you're in the bad group, creates all kinds of suffering because it results in judging one another and trying to eradicate those differences through man-made laws that then put about uh, punishment, penance. In other words, that punishment often can result in penitentiary or it can result in an actual penance, a meaning a price. So that's where we talk about the word penny the, as well as the word penance or repentance, all those times, remission of sins. And we'll get to that shortly because you bring up another question about that, but you reiterate about the thief and the robber and you basically you're reiterating this understanding that you've gotten through you're transitioning from orthodox christianity into gnostic christianity of this need to have two sets of people those that are of the right hand camp and left hand camp and those that are of the right hand camp are of christ and those that are not are of the devil and this is something that has been going on for quite a long time and really came about uh, after Calvinism and then especially in around 1920s and 1930 going into the 50s and 60s was very prevalent. It was a way to take control of the church at that time and to eradicate anyone that had a different understanding of scripture and that brought about all these laws and trying to bring evangelism uh, into politics and that has resulted in all kinds of conspiracy theories so forth and so on and, and a lot of suffering and distrust of one another that, that we're seeing today. Now when Christ talked about transcendency, he's saying that the full experience is both of the left and right hand path. You must have a knowledge of good and evil in order to understand the full. And that is the nature of the beast. It is not of you uh, that you must partake of this, but it is of the fact that you are in this realm. It's just a prerequisite. It is just the condition of this realm that you are part of continually part of the bloodshed because think of everything that you're eating even to stay alive something has to give way uh, whether it be you kill a chicken to have chicken dinner or if you're a vegetarian you're killing the plant so some life has to be taken in order to have life so that's the nature of this realm you see so to suggest that we can run away from that and not have blood on our hands by living in this realm is to fool ourselves and to be in illusory. So that's why when Christ talks about all have fallen short of the glory of God and all have sinned, this is just the nature of the beast, missing the mark. And the mark of understanding, again, in Gnosticism isn't this idea that we're wretched beasts because we do these things, because those things are unavoidable living in this realm, but rather that we have a misunderstanding of our true origins, that we are not just merely physical beings, that there's a Satan and a God and you choose between them, but rather that the full experience helps us to understand we are spiritual beings that are temporarily in a physical body, but our origins are of the Pleroma, and we are children of God, all of us. We are called forth to that revelation or that Gnostic moment in different points in different people's lives. Thank you very much for this great comment, Dory, and questions. Now moving on to uh, the next question you have here, again, that you reemphasize the understanding of the chosen group. I mentioned that you read on the video, they believe they are begotten by Jesus Christ, not created like all the other races, and it's certainly not the Cabal who believes this. The Cabal openly states their father is Lucifer. Now so much to unpack here. First off, Gnosticism, the word Lucifer is a title, another word that we, or phrase that we use in the Bible to refer to Lucifer is what's called the morning star. And Christ himself referred to himself as the morning star, as did a passage in chapter 14, Isaiah, where there are many interpretations of what, when they talk about the morning star, might mean. It might mean the devil. It might mean Christ. It might actually mean uh, Nebuchadnezzar II. But what's more important to understand when we use that word Lucifer, it is a title and that's it. 
nothing more, nothing less. That's why Christ even referred to himself as the morning star or Lucifer. Now the word Lucifer means he or she that bears light. We may bear light for selfish reasons or we may bear light for altruistic reasons. Of course, Christ bore light and was as a Lucifer figure when he came to bring light to this realm. He bore it. And to bear means to suffer. And so he suffered greatly for that. And those that do it selfishly suffer because the hoarding in and of itself is a form of solitude or isolation or suffering. Now, when you talk about the cabal and you talk about the chosen group, again, there's that propensity to want to go back to where the church, the Orthodox church, early on actually used that as a wedge to kill off all the Gnostics. There is an, a right interpretation of the Bible, which is the Orthodox that we see today. And I'm not referring to all Orthodox, I'm referring to the Proto-Orthodoxy that we understand from the early church fathers that did away with whether the Cathars or the Gnostics, so forth and so on. They went about to create the sentiment through division by suggesting there is a holy lineage and then there's an unholy lineage. And this is just the way it is. It's fated that way, that the true father and mother intended this, as though the true father and mother wouldn't be able to see that fading that would lead to an incredible amount of bloodshed and suffering. Because obviously that's going to result in those two eventually having an, an incredible confrontation. Again, Gnosticism does not see the true father and through that lens. The true father and mother is pure in all of its intent, pure of love, and steps back. Man must work out its own account. This is what allows for finding the truth that will set you free. That also brings about free will. Now, there is no anybody that is born of that race or this race. There is merely those that are begotten, which is not born of. There's not, those are not the same. When you are born again, you are a begotten of Christ. And Christ offered that message to everyone, the good news, that you are perfect just the way you are. Your spiritual self is perfect. It is part of Christ, the Christ within you, the hope of glory. You are part of God. Have I not said ye are gods? You are begotten when you understand that truth and you understand your origins. That's why it says Christ was the first begotten son. Now we wouldn't use the word first unless we understood there were other sons and daughters of God to come. And you will become one of those begotten sons and daughters of God when you accept and understand the true message of the Christ sent here to complete what Sophia began. We won't go into detail of that right now because that's a lot to unpack right now. This chosen group, you say, were begotten and placed here to be the new governors of the earth to take over and be placed above Lucifer. Now, again, those are titled, the word Lucifer's title, but when you talk about that, you're referring to, explicitly you're referring to Israelites, and that is an appointment that Demiurge brought about. And in fact, that is exactly the God that they worship, Jehovah of the Old Testament, they adhere to. They don't believe in the Christ. And so that would be also true to some extent, the, the Islamic race and anybody that follows after dogmatic understanding of existence and ways of being. It doesn't even have to be religious. It could be someone that's an atheist or an agnostic that believes in a hardline authoritarian approach is necessary which hints at the idea that there's only one way. It's my way or the highway. You go on and you say, however, they say Lucifer rebelled over this and set out to trick them into falling and relinquishing control back to him. Now, if you're referring to Lucifer as being the lie bearer in terms of the Demiurge, then the Demiurge was actually the one that was tricked. Now, the Demiurge, of course, uses along with his dominion, whether it be angels of the Demiurge or it be demons, he uses those devices, as it talks about uh, principalities in Paul talks about in order to beguile mankind. So in that sense, we agree. This group says it was the fallen angel Gadriel who tempted Eve and became the father of Cain. Now again, you're trying to bring about a blood lineage. Remember, this Gnosticism is spiritual in nature. It's not about a blood lineage because this talks about Dan Brown and trying to, again, create the whole monarchy. You know, the, this idea that there's a Christ lineage through Seth and then there's a Cain lineage that is of the devil, the workings of the father and mother from the beginning in order to bring about his ultimate outcome of us ascending back to him in transcendency is an understanding that is going to create great division. Now, is true in a physical sense that there is a lineage of Cain and a lineage of Seth, and it was the lineage of Seth that the angel Elilith brought to Nora uh, to carry forth in secret so that the Christ lineage may be brought through that. 
but it's through the understanding, it's through gnosis, not through the physical body. That gnosis was conceptualized through Mary, Mary being the mother, uh, meaning waters of life, Mare. Now, Cain, on the other hand, is going to the land of Nod, which is to the north, which would make up the Caucasus. That group would not carry that understanding. That would eventually become the Gentiles. Also, Cain would go to the north to intermingle with other Gentiles, but this would be an intermingling of that lineage of Adam with the Gentiles. But that came about in order to bring about paganism, and paganism would bring about a relinquishing of the law, which would then birth an ultimate understanding. That's when Christ talked about the first will be last and last will be first, because it was initially the Israelites, or the Hebrew, that was even before the Israelites were the Hebrew people through Adam and Eve at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that understood Gnosis and understood their origins. And they carried that in secret to Seth, their third son. But it was Cain that was left out because Seth came after Cain and Abel. Now, Cain, in that ignorance, was therefore an empty slate for the spirit in the universe to work through Cain. Whereas the Demiurge stepped in in the Garden of Eden to stop that knowledge, as we talked about the bruising of the, the head of the woman and of the serpent, which is the serpentine or seraphim race that brought that through Christ embodying through the seraphim at the tree. But it was when Christ walked earth, notice that the Jewish became last to accept the Christ message. And it was the Gentiles, the lineage of Cain, intermingling with the Gentiles that were the first to receive the Christ. So that's that understanding of that message, the first will be last and the last will be first. If I said that was the sword of the monarchies, I misspoke because I believe it was the Anunnaki who started the kingships as you read in one of my other posts on another video. We honestly don't know, but you know this does hint at Genesis where it talks about the Nephilim came down to earth and intermingled with men and saw the women were fair and had children with them, bore children. Uh, now, that may have been the way Lucifer in, in, in the disguise of uh, the, the Demiurge came down to earth through the Anunnaki in order to bring about rulership and confusing the languages and keeping man under its thumb, uh, under its control, basically, even onto this day. All the details don't matter so much, in my opinion, Dory. If you have a certain understanding about it, and I have a different understanding about the details, that's not as important as the ultimate message. This ultimate message is that Christ is telling us that we're all one. There is no groups of people. It's a spiritual seed, not a physical seed. Now, of course, that physical seed exists in this realm and plays its story out in this realm, and that's another story. But to focus on that is to miss it, the ultimate Gnostic message of transcendency away from focusing on division, but rather to focus on unity of purpose of Sophia and Christ, setting this all forth from the beginning. Thank you, Dory, for, again, another great question. Moving along to uh, the next one where you say, I'm glad you brought up the word monarchy because it explains itself so well. Mon meaning one and archi meaning rulership. Notice the archi is taken from archon, so it could be one ruler equals the demiurge. Absolutely, I agree with this. Now, moving along, Michael Reblido says, where or when can I learn about my origin story? Thank you. May the true Father bless you. All right. Now, the that is going to be coming up uh, when I release those set of videos, uh, which I hope to do over the course of the next couple of months. So definitely look forward to that. Now, if you're talking about you specifically, that is something that when your name is called in the Book of Life, when Christ calls you, and that will come about through various epiphanies, what in Gnosticism we call Gnosis, and only the timeline, only the Father knows in secret. It's sacred, not secret in the sense that I'm going to hoard it from you just because I want to, but rather it's sacred because it must be protected at all costs. Because if it were out in the open, then there would be so many potential enemies. But when the time comes, you will know, presumably think you're already on that pathway of revelation but it will come to you. Continue to meditate and pray on it. If you mean this in a personal sense, now if you mean it in a cosmological sense, those books will be coming out uh, and my read and interpretation will be coming out in the next couple months. So thank you, Michael, for such a great question. And then uh, Horse Reddish Root says, thank you for coming back. You're welcome. And again, I apologize for 
uh, being away for three months and I will do better to uh, release a video once a week so that everyone knows that we are still present and alive and well and folks won't worry so much about the channel and my well-being. Also, uh, at some point we will be having live streaming. Uh, I'm hoping to have every Sunday a gathering and we'll be inviting people to sing, uh, read um, passages. Uh, I'll be reading passages. We'll be ta uh, picking a topic. I'll be doing some kind of quote-unquote sermon. When this happens, I can't promise you, but I know that God has been leading me toward that and it's been on my mind so God has seeded that in me. Now thank you horse reddish root as you say this again for a second time and a third time. Evan Staley says are you going to upload the videos in the Gospel Philip? Absolutely and I think they're actually going to be the next set of videos if not a couple thereafter. And thank you, Evan, for continuing with us. And then Michael Reblito says, May the true God be with you. Thank you, Michael, and the same with you. I appreciate your teaching. Question. I need to understand why, how was it that Christ was made to suffer the way he did? I really feel bad about that. I don't want to feel ashamed that he went through that, but I still do. I understand now what I do is a reflection on me, not the true father and mother. Now, you don't say mother, but I always end, I add, that, add that myself all the time to remind us that it's barbello and the profundity. Christ's death on the cross, what exactly is that supposed to mean from the Gnostic understanding? I believe the true God is good. All right, this is such a wonderful question because it goes to the heart of one of the main differences between proto-Orthodox Christianity and Gnostic Christianity. In Gnostic Christianity, as you well know, the point of Christ dying on the cross is because we human beings are wretched. It is a result of human beings being wretched and us needing to come to repentance uh, openly admitting and mouthing as it says in Romans 10 9 and 10 at least the modern day interpretation of that along with believing in the story the historical account of Christ walking and three days rising and this being the Son of God that that is all necessary that Christ needed to sacrifice himself because that's what the Hebrew did when they sacrificed their lambs and their cows and they all had to be pure in order to appease an angry God to make up for sin because the nature of this realm is such that if you take something from it it also must be taken from you so that is the very understanding of this realm uh, it's a realm of sacrifice it's a sacrificial lamb uh, we are sackcloth it's sacred in nature but we also get the word um, sacroid meaning in other words it is made of the flesh and the flesh realm essentially is going to be a realm it's always trying to balance good and evil but it always also puts them into disequilibrium and disharmony so that it can then be the hero problem action solution create a problem go into action and then provide a solution so that everything is always going back to the demiurge and their minions we need them to be saved so this is the whole story and christ is just another one of those characters who needs to appease God. It's only through blood because remember even in Genesis it talked about the, when they sacrificed the lamb, the aroma, the, you know, the aroma of, of the dead carcass and the blood went up to the, the Lord and he was pleased. So that's the Old Testament God understanding. And so dying on the cross is a way of basically exchanging uh, or that term that's used uh, equivalent exchange. And you can see that just in everyday life. Even if you have to eat, you have to kill something, right? So Christ is setting forth that example on the cross of the way things are in this realm. That's a Gnostic lens of that death of Christ on the cross. Now, the Orthodox Christianity would say, no, it's about we are a wretched beast and we are sinful. We can't save ourselves and Christ has to do it for us. But in Gnosticism, we see that Christ is setting forth an example for us to follow. Remember, he said that he came to set forth an example. In other words, I am the way, the light, and truth and to life, eternal life, and come follow me. So he's not asking us to passively just consider that you know, in our minds, how horrible I feel, I feel remorseful and regretful. That pentive state is a state that is going to call you to action. So it's a thoughtful state, pensive state. That's where you get the word repentance. Pent and pensive, they stem from the same word, is to contain thought or contain a out of control, wild way or unbridled way of living that leads to suffering and death. And so when we repent, we are putting ourselves in a state of 
thoughtfulness or pensiveness or even you think of the word penitentiary and being locked away we lock ourselves away that's why christ talks about going in a closet and praying or he goes out in the desert for 40. it's in other words a way of meditating you're putting yourself in a state away from everything you've ever been taught and learned and the world around you so that you're not distracted so you can be on your path to calvary in gnosticism it's about christ going to the cross to nail on the cross once and for all on his right and left hand be it west and east and the north and south his head and feet once and for all open for all the world to see nothing to hide who he is exactly and being proud of that you see and forgiven the world for what it is you know see it's the lack of gnosis that brings about the suffering it's the lack of gnosis that brings about humanity being the way it is it isn't humanity in and of itself that's evil because Gnosticism or Gnosis resides in everybody. In some people, it's more dormant than others, but that potential is in everybody. When Christ went to the cross, he basically ripped open the curtain so that that light would shine forth through all humanity to make it available to everybody. Going to the cross is your mission. What is your name, your calling, your road to Calvary? Christ set that example. It must be one that despite all the obstacles, despite all the suffering that you're going to have to go through, all the naysayers, people throwing stones, calling you awful, uh, exercising you, or castigating you, that you remain on the path to Calvary. You go to the cross. An example of that, think of an Olympian. Think about people that say, oh no, you're never going to make it to the Olympics, or why don't you do something better for life that's going to make you more money? I mean, think about the odds of that. Or I want to be a baseball player, or whatever it happens to be. And everybody's going to chastise you or make fun of you along that pathway. Not only that, but everything that needs to happen along the way for you to get to the Olympics in the first place, all the sacrifices, all the disciplining, as well as when you finally arrive there, that's that penultimate moment penultum coming from the word five and also coming from the word penance remember we, this is all it's all the same you see it's all stemming from that same understanding it's getting into a meditative state about what is your calling what did the father mother seed in you how can you be focused on that pathway and not be distracted because that's the way of things you see so that you may glorify in your your accomplishment because when you are glorified through that accomplishment you're glorifying the, the father mother because is the father mother that seeded that accomplishment accomplishment in you much as putting a seed in the ground brings forth fruit in the spring you see and that's glorifying and then we take taste of his nectar so too the olympian must go and stay on that path despite everything that he or she must bear along that pathway in that penultimate moment that few seconds they run that race or they do that swim they may win or lose but in the end they m must finish it and that's the two things that christ said when he went to the cross the two most important things the first being he said father forgive them for they know not what they do letting you know indirectly that all suffering comes from one thing and one thing only it's not fear it's not any of that it's one thing and one thing only it's ignorance it's not knowing and so that's why we are Gnostic Christian and not, I don't know, you know, Christians that believe that it's just all about what you believe and that's it. You know, it's like a historical account that I believe in this and I also believe I'm, I'm a wretched and I'm no good inside. You are wonderful. You're perfect. You are the work of God itself. It is this realm that is distracting you. It's this realm that puts you to sleep. And that's why Christ said that he walked among men and they knew it not. For darkness has shrouded their minds and their hearts. Darkness is all around. It's there to challenge you. And the second thing that Christ said that was so essential is he said, when he finally completed the task, he first asked God, he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Now many will say, well, oh, oh look there, Christ is doubting God. No, he said, why have you forsaken me? He's, he's asking, are you forsaken because I completed the task? Or are you forsaken me for a different reason? To prove that is when Christ follows up and says, after a few minutes, and the Spirit went to heaven, after he said that, he committed his Spirit to heaven, then he said this, he said, it is finished. And so, at that moment, Christ understood, he said, Father, why have you, why have you left me? Because it's in the moment that everybody abandoned you completely, and is also the moment when you abandon yourself and everybody abandons you. Is that moment of glory that everybody doesn't think of anything other than you being on that cross. In other words, that moment, that glory moment, she won that gold medal. Everybody's in that glorific state and nobody's thinking anything else. And it's that moment that you have accomplished 
everything that you set out to do. And it's that moment the task has been completed. And so that is the whole walk. And that's the Gnostic understanding of Christ going to Calvary and going to the cross. And he nails suffering and he releases the physical body and the soul body once and for all, being imprisoned to the demiurge in this realm. So you are now free because you have found the truth and the truth indeed has set you free from the realm of suffering. I don't know if that answers your question, but Michael, feel free to ask follow-up questions if you'd like further clarification. But such a wonderful, wonderful question, so essential to our understanding of Gnostic Christianity. Thank you. Now, Doria says here, Thomas 8.10, could you share how you came to understand about the word repent? That's not what I'm finding about its etymology. I'm not finding that it has anything to do with the word penny, which would come from penance. Repent, I'm finding, comes from repentir, to feel regret from sins or crimes. Now, repentance and penance actually stem from a similar word. Now, we're going to see that here shortly. Let's go to the etymology. Let's start with that word repentance. As it says here, be grieved over one's past and seek forgiveness. Feel such regret for sins, crimes, or admission as produces amendment of life. Now, from Old French, repentir. Now, that's so essential. That word repentir comes from the 11th century. So that's 10 or a thousand years between Christ's message and the old French interpretation. By that time, the old church fathers had been embedded, and everybody that followed the old church fathers had been embedded into this understanding of Christ's message of forgiveness of sins being regret and a mission, uh, you know, feeling sorry for yourself and shame and guilt. That had already happened. Now, that repent is broken up into R-E and P-E-N-T. So R-E means very much or it means again. And the other part of it, P-E-N-T, means a place of imprisonment or a place, a, a stopping place, a, st a place of status. That's where we get the word penitentiary. We also get the word pen that we use to write with because ink is placed in a container, a, a storage place so that that ink can be transferred into a new thought through writing. And so it is that transitory state between the old man and the new man, so you have the renewing of the mind. Now you asked about the word penny. The word penny, you're correct. It, now penny does come from the word penance, but what we're doing is, in order for that to take shape, we must have paid a price. Now who's paid the price? Of course it's the Christ. Penance is, if we look at the word uh, pensive, to think, that's where that word comes from, to weigh, to consider. Engage in serious thought, meditative, contemplative. That's the first thing us to understand, thoughtful. Essentially, the state of penance is a state of pensiveness, but deep in pensiveness that is brought on because one either regrets the way that they've lived before, or they see a new understanding that brings sorrow or melancholy, etc. But understand, the state of penance itself is not that sorrowfulness, that sadness, or that mel melancholy, guilt, or shame. Those are the things that leads one to the state of penance. The state of penance itself is a deep state that that sadness, sorrowfulness, melancholy, shame, and guilt has led you to a deep state of meditative contemplativeness and thoughtfulness to reconsider the renewing of the mind. In other words, a renewing of the mind is necessary in order for us to live a different way. The word penny, so let's look up that word. All right, now, so this word is also comes from the same thing we get the word pence, P-E-N-C-E. -E. It's an individual coin or a piece. Let's find the noun. Contraction of pennies, collect a plural penny, or cent, 100. So that's what that means, pen, pen, cent. So again, what did we understand about the word pen, P-E-N? So let's look at that word, P-E-N. Writing implement made from a hard, hollow stem. Okay, we know that part, but how about the word itself be the word pent? So let's look at that word, kept in, confined. So that's why we use a pen to confine the ink in something material so that we have something we pick up and transfer a thought into reality. So that's why we use the word penance because we're in a state in the transition from an old person to a new person. We are in a state of considering renewing our mind. And so the same way we get that word P-E-N, we also get the word penny and penance and repentance. They all come from the same thing. And Pentagon, that's another one, but I'm not going to go into that, otherwise we'd be talking forever. 
All right, now I'm going to bring out a couple other words because you you bring up something else here momentarily. First, the word forgive, for, F-O-R. We also get the word before. You got the word give, to give or to receive. And for here, it meaning away, opposite, completely f away from, you see. So it means to go in a different direction than what is. So that's the first part. And give. Now, give is, I think we all understand that word, but we'll look at it anyway. Capacity for yielding pressure, that which is given or offered. And in a verb form, to give, bestow, deliver to another, commit, devote, entrust. So the key word here is entrust and commit. So when you are being forgiven, it means essentially what is it that you are allotting your energy to? What are you committing and devoting yourself to? What are your, where is your mind? Where is it being entrusted to? Well, maybe the idea you don't trust that person or you want to hate that person or you're no longer devoted to them. Whatever you're allotting your, your mind, you're bestowing your mind, it's energy to. That is what give means. What are, where are you yielding your energy, essentially? And so when we forgive, we're essentially walking away from that understanding and having a new understanding. So that's what it means. So what does it mean? It means when we're being forgiven, we're taken back before the Old Testament Orthodox understanding of the Bible, or when what the Demiurge brought about through Jehovah. So what what was before that? Before that was the true Father Mother that Christ brought to us in the Pleroma, that solace is perfect and created it just the way we are. Each one of the seeds with a name that will reveal itself through time. Much in a way a seed is in the dirt, we're brought down here in the dirt, and then we'll root, take root, and then we'll will ripen. All right, now the other word is remission, forgiveness or pardon. That's the French understanding. Now let's go deeper than that. So remit, to forgive, pardon. The word remit is to go back. The word mit, so what does that mean? It is the meaning allow, to remain unpaid, refrain from exacting. So remit is to go back before there was a penalty or a punishment. And so that's when we're talking about the remission of sins, we're talking about going back before there was this concept of sin and forgiveness of sin, going back before we were given this understanding of how we saw ourselves. We saw ourselves as the source of suffering, as the source of all wrongdoing, the source of all everything that happened is happening now at that Garden of Eden, that one moment that that one woman took of that one quote-unquote apple. We have a new understanding now, a renewing of the mind of the way we understand Christ's message now, which is no, repentance and remission of sins means to go back before we were given that understanding, because prior to that understanding was the true Father's message of how things really are, and that we are perfect. God loves us just the way we are. Always has been, always is, and always will be. So, Dory, thank you. Hopefully that answered your question. Again, just reiterate, because you say here to feel regret from sins or crimes. Now, again, I want to reemphasize, repentance is not the state of of regret. That is what the French definition of that word is after a thousand years of uh, the old church influencing Europe. That's when we talk about the Gospel of Philip that takes us back to the original understanding of that word. Again, remember, re regret, shame, guilt, all those things can lead you to penance, but penance itself is not the state of regret and shame and guilt and all those things. Penance is a state of confinement, much in the way Christ talks about going to a closet to pray or going to the desert. You get putting yourself into a state, meditative state, to consider everything that's led you to suffering so that you not repeat those same mistakes and you put on a renewing of the mind so you take a new understanding and you have a new walk that leads you to different outcomes. Michelle Learn says, listening to your videos has changed my life in a profound way just through changing my perceptions. You're teaching and putting into form content that is for me both self-affirming and cathartic. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing that. That helps me understand these videos are of value and encourages me to continue. I've been waiting a long time for the missing puzzle pieces. Thank you for devoting your time and energy to put out these videos. Again, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for being with us. Peter Olden says, Hi, Thomas. I've watched with much interest at the comments after your post. Although interesting, they are but distraction, and this is something we have to be aware of. So I want to say thank you for saying that, Peter, and I have come to that understanding over the past couple months because I've been really toying over what to do about addressing everyone's comments, and the truth is 
I'm not going to be able to do that, particularly as the channel grows larger and larger. So I'll only be picking out the questions people ask and I have time to do. And you are correct. It can be a distraction if we're spending too much time on that and delaying the other books of the Gnostic text. So thanks for that reminder. You go on to say, I have been around a long time and have witnessed some great teaching, but please note, distraction creeps in, it takes many forms, although people, meanwhile, often a single word can lead us away from what it is. And you're correct, because it can lead us down into the, you know, essentially the bob wire of discussions about, you know, who's on the right side and wrong side, wrong side that eventually leads to suffering and pain and mass shootings and death and war. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. I now hear of wars, high cost of living, Republican, Democrat, Donald Trump, the list goes on. You must be aware that the false god of this world will continue to create distraction so we will remain enslaved. Absolutely. That is not the walk. So thank you for reminding us. The walk, again, is an inner walk. It's about continually meditating in prayer for Gnostic moments so that we increase in spirituality, in the way of Christ. Christ's walk is the way, and everything else is a distraction. And ultimately, getting in tune with what is our mission here in completing that, that pathway. So thank you, Peter, again. Michelle Learn says, I like the integration of astrology in your commentary. I previously thought that religion and astrology were two completely disparate concepts. You have helped to unveil a meaningful connection that demonstrates how they are interrelated. Absolutely, Michelle. Thank you for that. Come on, Thomas. Don't keep us hanging like this. We are eagerly awaiting your return. Hopefully I've addressed uh, that Mickey Pope uh, earlier. I will be making concerted effort to make these uh, videos on the more regular ideally once a week at the latest once every two weeks and i needed a, uh, uh, some time to step away but i do apologize if people were concerned uh, as before i was away for a couple years and people might have doubted the channel was going to continue but if i am away more than two or three months which i hope not to do again but if something comes up i will let you know thank you and dory we already went through the comment dory made about monarchy and then uh, dory let's read this one and then we're going to probably i think we're almost near the end so uh let's read this one because she does have a question great question here i never hear you say anything about being born again and living by faith in the finished work of christ on the cross now you probably haven't been with the channel long enough but when i was bringing out the other videos as we went much more deep into the gnostic text definitely those topics were much more discussed and brought up but i will uh, definitely agree the first couple books that i reintroduced again on this channel doesn't really go into details about the crucifixion and its meaning but i did discuss that earlier with michael who had asked about that uh and his dilemma about the um going you know christ going to the cross but i want to remind everyone that was christ's path and glorify in that and don't focus on the death because the death is releasing the physical body is releasing the spirit and then you'll go to a higher realm so that's a beautiful thing and he completed his mission and though very horrific, we all daily must carry that cross. We all go through suffering, and it's just the way of this realm. All right, so you say here, he said at the Last Supper that the cup which represented his blood was for a covenant, which would be for the remission of sins. Now, hopefully you, now you understand the way I share with you Gnostics' understanding of remission of sins, which is to go back and remember your, your mission. You see that word remission? And your mission is what's important. And sins is missing the mark of understanding of that truth. You see, that's all sin is, is missing the mark of understanding of your origins, of the good news that Christ brought to you, that you are not a wretched beast. You don't need to adhere to a set of laws and try to pick people out and judge who's of this lineage or that lineage or who's of the devil and who's of Christ. You see, those are all distractions. This focus on self is the remission of sins because that's when you understand what Christ's message is. Christ's message was to forgive us of those sins. Though when they're forgiven, they're forgiven once and for all. They don't need to be looked at ever again. You don't need to focus on the mistakes. You don't need to focus on that anymore. Christ did it already for you. So you don't have to do it again. Christ wants to remind you, Sophia, the mother, father, that they have always loved you and will continue to love you just the way you are, along with all your mistakes. Your mistakes are merely out of ignorance. And even if you do them purposely, knowingly. You only do it purposely, knowingly, because you don't know better. And if you think you know better, and you're still doing it, you still don't know better. Because if you knew better, you wouldn't do those things. And what you struggle with is not knowing how to do it differently. Not because you're wretched. You are part of the tapestry. And so remission of sins means to go back, get back on track, get back on your mission of sins, 
means to be cleansed from sins, to be cleansed from that understanding. And in fact, there is no real remission of sins with an S. There's only remission of sin, which is the lack of understanding of your true origin and your true nature, which you are perfect. Your spiritual being is perfect. It's your physical body that is flawed, but that isn't your fault. You took on that body and you did it because you wanted to come here to complete a mission that Christ, the Father, Mother, Sophia set in you to complete. That's what you focus on. That's the remission of sins. Mainline Christians don't believe in salvation by works, but by grace. Remember, it says in Hebrew, faith without works is empty. So absolutely, you have to have the faith. You have to have the faith that there is pernoia in action, that God is always doing good. Just as Michael said before, that he believes God is good. And if you believe God is good, then God can only do and think good things through you and of you. That faith without works, the faith is the part where you believe in the goodness of God. And the works part is you completing your road to Calvary, completing your mission, putting that into action, what you were called here to do. You also never mentioned that Jesus began his ministry with the words, repent and be baptized. Now I have previously, but again, I don't know how long you have been on this channel, but recovering that again, repent, is to go back into a state of mind, a prayer, meditative thought, pensiveness. It's not the uh, staying in the state of guilt and remorse and shame and guilt and all of that. That's not going to solve anything. It just will worsen it. That is merely some tools, mechanisms this world uses to get you to do what it wants you to do. And sometimes it's used in a healthy way to get you to to uh, consider your life, meditate on what you're doing. Other times it's used to manipulate you, to feel bad about yourself, and you lose self-esteem so people can have control over you. So repent is, again, going back into that state of pensiveness. It's going into that state of thoughtfulness, renewing your mind uh, and having a new understanding about self and orientation to the world and God and everything in it. And saying to yourself, I'm not a wretched beast. I do these things because of my body, because of this realm, this world that I'm in. But should I let that world and this body control me? Or do I have the power to change things? Yes, you absolutely do. God has given you that power. That is the spirit of Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, that's repentance. And the baptism is merely that state of being dunked into this realm from the pleroma above the water into the murky waters. You are in the murky waters now. And when Christ came, he came to rise you back up. So when he says he went back to heaven, I bring to you the Holy Spirit. So in other words, a pathway back to raise you out from the murky waters. That is the whole symbolism of baptism. It isn't the actual physical doing of the baptism, you know, holding your nose, uh, some priest holds your nose and dunks you in water and raises you back up that Christ is talking about. That is great if it helps you to do that, but God doesn't require some physical ask action of you. And if you don't do it, then you're condemned to hell for all eternity or you'll be like zapped out of eternity. The baptism is for you, just as Christ said. He said the Sabbath was made for man, not for God. And so too is the baptism is made for man, not for God. If it helps you, then do it. If it helps you to understand the symbolic meaning of baptism, then do it, which is a reminder that you were dunked into this murky realm, but you have the power to raise back out of the murky realm. That's the whole act of baptism and the water to purify you so you remember your pure state. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't know if that answered your question, Dory, but feel free to continue to ask questions if you need further clarification about the way I understand the Bible and Gnostic text. Michael Riboli says, first, thank you for taking the time to motivate me into enlightenment. I need to understand why Jesus took on the beating, mental anguish, and suffering he did. All right, so we did address that, Michael, and I know you're probably asking it a second time to make sure that I saw that question and since I had been absent for a couple months. And then thank you for coming back. All righty. It's been uh, great reading through everybody's questions and comments, and please do continue to feel free to leave any comments and questions on any of the videos. And this is our communion with one another. And I really appreciate every one of you. And feel free, again, to reach out to me personally if you need to. That's um, uh, the First Gnostic Church of Christ at gmail.com. Until next time, stay at peace.